So ICS, University of Salford, and other places in the world perhaps, and other organisations like these, might move forward on some of these things. So, I'd like some responses to what I've been saying. Questions, and so on. Uh, earlier you mentioned you um, had worked a little bit with issues of artificial intelligence and those kinds of discussions. I'm just wondering how, how you um, have applied the beard or, or how you've engaged with those discussions. Okay, artificial intelligence. <coughs> Um, what's your name? Matt. Matt. <clears throat> right, the artificial intelligence question is, is computer similar to a human being? Question mark. And there are two answers, yes and no. And lots of other answers in between. And there's been, since the 1970s, there's been, or 1960s, there's been, the argument has gone on and on and on, and this has not been resolved. And there are still people who say yes, and still people who say no. And it's great fun to get involved in that argument and to try and think things out. But it's never ending. Then I realised using not Doiwe's aspects, but his idea of ground motives. Do you know the ground motives? Um, th in, let's, for those who, does, it, does everyone know the ground motives? The, the, yeah, who knows? Okay, so I don't need to go through them. There's a Greek ground motive of form and matter. And part of the argument, the, the argument between yes and no is based on <coughs> form and matter. Computers are matter. The human mind is form, if you like, brain-mind argument. How can brains create minds? How can matter create a mind thinking? And that's the basis on which the argument proceeds. Then there are some, including John Searle, who take the nature grace ground motive, or as I prefer to call it, the nature supernature ground motive. That is, there's, there's a, two layers, supernature and nature. John Searle says, computers work by physical causality, humans work by mental, biological causality, <clears throat> and so they cannot be the same thing. <clears throat> what he means by biological causality, he doesn't actually say. <coughs> Andrew, hmm? a couple of cough lozenges there, or strike lozenges up on the table there. Oh, okay, thank, thank you. I wonder what those were. <laughs> I'm trying to get your attention by if you were busy in the screen before that. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, nature and supernature. Uh, physical and biological. What he's saying is that the biological causality is a kind of super, super physical or magic causality compared with physical causality of computers, and therefore they cannot be the same. And there are others who come back to him and say, yes, yes, they are the same because life evolved from physical materials, etc., etc. And you know, the, the argument goes on and is never ending. And then there are people who uh, who were, um, argue on the basis of nature and freedom. Computers are deterministic. Well, at least we hope they are, unless until they do go wrong. Humans are free. So how can the deterministic produce something that's free? And Alan Newell tried to argue this. And tried to, he brought up an uh, argument about the knowledge level which uh, tried to say that freedom comes out of determinism and so on. 
which was not very convincing, except to him. So there are, the argument itself seems to go along these three lines, which suggests that the fourth grand motive of creation, fall and redemption, of Doyavir, I don't actually like that term, I call it meaning, the meaning grand motive. Now that Doivid introduced a new type of subject-object relationship. Whereas Descartes says the subject is active and the object is passive, Doivid said we operate both as subjects and objects in response to the laws of all the aspects. Everything could be a subject and everything could be an object. So, we can see a computer operating and ask the question, for example, can computers think? That is, operate in the analytical aspect. If we take the, the computer's subject functioning, it functions as subject only up to the physical aspect and not any further. Therefore, the answer is no. If we take the computer as object, as object within human functioning, within any aspect, then the answer can be yes. The computer can think on behalf of us. Or, let's put it in a different way. Can the computer find, uh, find a route for us to follow? Yes. Of course it can. We do this with Google Maps. Oh, wait a minute. We do this with Google Maps. And there's a creator of Google Maps who put into the computer the ability to do this. So the, to say that Google Maps finds us a route to follow only makes sense in relation to our, tr our wanting to find a route uh, along the map or can a computer diagnose a disease only makes sense in relation to us wanting to do something in terms of diagnosing a disease. If there were no humans to, to guide, then Google Maps might do so, seem to do some stuff, but it wouldn't really actually find any routes. Okay? So, go back to this question. Can our computers like a human? This Operating according to this grand motive is fruitless. Operating according to this is fruitless. Operating according to this is fruitless. They might be fun, but they're fruitless. Operating according to this is fruitful. Right, does that?